This is JCT TV. It's Bible study for the 21st century. So friends, welcome again to Jim Canlon today. I'm always delighted to come your way and I look forward to it. I really do. I hope you do too. Uh, we are very slowly, and what else is new? I did that with Matthew and Mark, so might as well do it with Luke, but slowly, slowly going through Luke. And uh, last um, teaching segment, last time, uh, we were just into Jesus uh, being approached by a leper and we had to call it because of time. We'll pick it up where we left off right after this break. WOW works with local churches in needy countries. We mobilize those churches, pastors, and volunteers in a concerted effort to care for orphans and widows in their homes and villages. Through that strong faith-based platform, we're able to not only provide food, medicine, and crisis intervention, but we're also able to lead these afflicted ones to faith in God. It's powerful, humbling, and well worth the effort. Please support WOW with your generous gifts and faithful prayer. Thank you. So friends, last time uh, Jesus had just been uh, approached by a leper. And uh, let, me, let me read again that passage. I'd read it last program, but let me read it again. It happened when he was in a certain city. Luke doesn't tell us which city it was. Behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus. Now, full of leprosy means full of leprosy. Leprosy is a degenerative disease, and it starts here and it gets deeper and deeper and deeper until eventually it takes over. So he's full of leprosy. Fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Then he put out his hand and touched him. That is, Jesus put out his hand and touched the leper, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him. And he, Jesus, charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. Okay, um, I, I made this point last time. I'm going to make it again. Leprosy. If you had leprosy, you were persona non grata. You were basically living literally on the fringes of, of civilization. You're not allowed to come into town. Um, you, you lived rough, as they say. You may have had a little tent that you built for yourself or some little uh, hovel. Most of them tried to find shelter in caves, and there's a lot of caves in, uh, in that part of the world. Uh, but they were outside of the city. They were outside of social contact. And even though they may have had family members living in town, you know, you talk about social distancing. In fact, I made the point last time, uh, think, think this in terms of modern terms. COVID-19, social distancing, even to the point where it was believed by the people of Jesus' time that leprosy was contracted by breathing in the breath of the leper. So you had to stay beyond, you know, the, the, the reach of the breath. So social distancing was the order of the day. You didn't touch. In many ways, kind of similar to what we're facing right now. He falls on his face, and because he was full of leprosy, he probably had lost his nose. Um, if you Google leprosy, you'll probably see some pictures of people who are leprous, losing uh, digits, losing toes, nose, ears, uh, sort of external extremities, uh, because um, there's no sense of, um, of touch. Uh, you, you lose, if you will, the nerve ending sensitivity to touch, which means you lose the nerve ending sensitivity to injury. And uh, it's by those devices, if you will, that eventually toes are injured and then they fall off and uh, I'm not a doctor so I won't get any, go any further than that but he comes to Jesus and you can be sure that wherever Jesus went people followed him 
as this leper approached Jesus, the people backed off. Guaranteed. Not Jesus, he stood there. And let the leper come right up to him, to the point where he puts out his hand and touches him. This was absolutely forbidden. Because as soon as you touched the leper, you became, if you will, contaminated yourself. The fact that Jesus did this was an astonishment to the people. And certainly to his newly minted disciples, they couldn't believe what they were seeing. Luke doesn't comment on that, but, um, you know, uh, let, let me let me just, just get back to some of the Old Testament scriptures here for a minute. I won't read them or quote them, but in, in Leviticus 13, um, Moses describes in detail various afflictions of the skin under the general heading of leprosy. Uh, some of these, quote, defiling skin diseases, unquote, were temporary and curable. So something could be called leprosy that wasn't. It could have been severe psoriasis or some kind of a skin rash or infection. Uh, but under the general category of leprosy, they were afraid of them because they didn't have antibiotics. They didn't have modern medicine as we know it. And these afflictions had to run their course. But leprosy, leprosy uh, didn't go away. It ran its course eventually by killing uh, the, the victim. But any kind of defiling skin disease, Moses made this very clear, um, had to be dealt with uh, with a cure. And that cure was always mediated through the priestly class. Uh, the priest was like the local medical authority. And um, a priest had to declare a person cured. Um, and uh, they were also given a certificate of their cure. But if the priest said, no, you are incurable, as would be the case with somebody who literally had that leprosy uh, illness, um, they had to isolate themselves for the rest of their lives. There was, there, was, there was no cure for this. So as I say, they had to live outside the city, outside the villages, outside the towns, many in caves. And any time a healthy person inadvertently uh, approached or was approached by a leper, the leper, seeing this, would cover their mouth like this and cry, unclean, unclean, unclean. And this was the warning to the person to stay away. Socially distanced, <laughs> more than six feet. Like, just go away. Because if you come any closer, you're going to catch it. And so it was anathema to be anywhere within the vicinity of a leper and certainly to touch them. You just didn't do that. So that was the case. So when Jesus touches this, first of all, lets the leper come to him. Well, Jesus' followers back way off. And then when he asked Jesus to heal him, Jesus says, I, I will, I can. I and, and he, he touches him. Uh, wow. Not only is a leper breaking the rules in his bold approach to Jesus, and uh, Jesus broke the rules, you know, by, by touching him. And, and any of those witnessing the exchange would have been amazed, if not horrified. And Luke reports an immediate healing. And for the first of many times to come, Jesus is not amazed at himself. He's not amazed the guy's been healed. He, for Jesus, this is another day at the office. But what Jesus doesn't want is undue publicity. He doesn't want to be a mobile medical clinic. He doesn't, doesn't want to be known just because of his capacity to heal and deliver people from their afflictions. So he charges a man to tell no one. Well, let, let, me, just, uh, let me just read that for you, okay? I'll just get rid of this writing here, first of all. Uh, but the report went around, verse 15, concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. The very thing Jesus didn't want to happen, didn't want to happen, happened. Um, and I, I mean that. Jesus, you know, Jesus was, was human. He was, he was just as human as he was divine. Uh, he had to sleep, he had to eat, he had to drink water, you know. Uh, otherwise, how could Satan have tempted him in the wilderness? 
apart from his humanity, how, how do you tempt him? He was just as human as you and I are. But uh, he, um, he could only take so much of the pressure of the crowds. And so as we see in verse 16, he himself, and let me just, uh, let, me, let, let me highlight this, often withdrew into the wilderness, okay, that means a place where people aren't, and prayed. Interesting with that wilderness thing over the course of, uh, you know, uh, church history, um, there have always been um, aesthetics who believe that God is closest where people are farthest. And so you go into the wilderness and there you're able to, in an untrammeled, unpolluted kind of way, uh, have access to uh, the presence of God. Um, so wilderness is less people, more God. That was the view for centuries. And it could very well have been the view in Jesus' time too. But anyway, that's one place where you can get away from the people. And he prayed, okay? Um, I'm not preaching a sermon here. I'm just taking you through the gospel. But I think it's worth mentioning that um, we all need time with our Heavenly Father. And I'm not talking about prayer, you know, as a recitation of a... Uh, uh, a list of agenda items. You know, we, we, we need to purge ourselves of a lot of our praying. You know, just take stock of some of your praying. Is it just asking, 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 asking God for stuff? Uh, I need this, I need that, and, and so-and-so needs this. And, 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 and do you spend much time, if, all, if at all, in your prayer telling God what to do? Now, if you'll just do this, if you just do that, and Lord, if you go there. and uh, the, the Bible tells us that the Lord knows what we need before we ask Him. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't ask. You have not because you ask not, the Bible will say. It's appropriate at times to ask, to petition the Lord. But the thing the Lord is looking for more than our requests is our fellowship, our presence. And prayer, listen to me now, to me is 95% listening. Did you hear that? 95% listening. Instead of me talking, let God talk. Through his word, through the still small voice, his spirit to your spirit, let the Lord minister to you. Speak comfort, speak direction, speak his will into your life without you cutting him off with your agenda items or with what you think he should be doing. I mean, really, the presumption of that? <laughs> You're dealing here with the omniscient, sovereign God of the universe. You gonna tell him what to do? Not smart. <laughs> I'll be back right after this. has called us to be the repairers of wars and to take care of the widow and the orphan in their time of need. And that is exactly what we do. Lives are changing. Why? Because Jesus is Lord. And why? Because Christians have come together as a body. The united body of Christ is coming and saying, it stops with this generation. We break it and we move on. The kind of religion that God endorses is to care for orphans and widows in their distress, justice, and to keep oneself unpolluted from the world, righteousness.
Now, as I did last program, friends, I want to take a little break from my teaching segment just to give you an update on the work that we're doing with Working for Orphans and Widows. You see us promoting WOW on the program. That's an organization, uh, a, a charity that my wife and I established 21 years ago, and it is incorporated both in Canada and the United States of America. Uh, it is uh, working in um, Sub-Saharan Africa and also now in Southern India, and we are working exclusively with orphans and widows. That is our work, and our exclusive work within that exclusive people group is home-based care. We care for people who are dying. We care for people who are afflicted. We care for people who have no food security. Uh, we care for people who have minimal shelter. We care for people who have no defense against sexual predation. In fact, we try to fulfill, you know, the words of Psalm 68 verse five, where it says that God is a father to the fatherless and a defender of widows. And so we, you know, we, we can't save the world, but we can certainly defend and um, uh, look after uh, orphans and widows that the Lord leads us to and over the course of 21 years in various countries in sub-Saharan Africa and now also in southern India the Lord has led us to literally thousands of orphans and widows who without help from God's people would not have any hope of survival. It's pretty desperate stuff really and uh, uh, a lot of you are interested in our work and want to know more about it. I gave you a little update last program I'll give you an update this program and then I'll do again the same God willing next month. But let's just take a look at a few things here. Uh, the COVID-19 issue is huge. Last program I showed you one woman who was uh, uh, working on her sewing machine. Uh, these sewing machines, by the way, are foot operated. Uh, we get them uh, in Asia somewhere. But she's making masks for our volunteers. Just in Malawi, we've got a thousand volunteers, and these are all local church-based. And in Zambia, we have, I think, about 300 volunteers. Uh, in South Africa, we've got, I think, about 100 volunteers. Um, in, um, in India, we're working, I think, with a smaller group of volunteers, around 25 or 30 of them. But the point is that these volunteers are absolutely critical because anything we do with WOW in Africa and India is done through local church ministry, not by us directly. I, I felt right from the very beginning, being a pastor myself, with my high view of the local church, that the local church needed to be caring for these people. And so over the 21 years, we've dealt over 21 years with thousands and thousands and thousands, scores of thousands of orphans and widows. Uh, all of them have been ministered to by local church volunteers. And so everything is done in the name of Jesus. And for many of those who were dying and did die, they died in the faith. These precious local church volunteers not only cared for their physical needs, uh, but also led them to the Lord. And to me, that's bottom line. That's the, the, the beautiful combination of righteousness and justice. Uh, you know, love for God and love for neighbor. How can you beat that? You can't. So um, this woman is making masks for those wonderful volunteers. And here's some of the volunteers, and they're getting ready to go out into one of the local villages. This is this one here. Uh, this this is Malawi, I do believe, and you see them what they're doing, and it's so very African. Uh, they don't just pray; they sing and they dance as they pray, and so they're dancing and praying and reaching out to the Lord and praising Him for His blessings and His His mercy and His kindness, and also praying the Lord will. Just give them strength as they go out and give strength to these stricken orphans and widows. You see they're all wearing masks that have been provided by uh, other uh, volunteers who have made those masks for them. Here we, ha and I, I'm skipping around here, but um, we work not only with uh, local uh, black Africans, but we also work in South Africa with local white Africans. I know that some t that seems a little dissonant. A white African, hello? Yeah. They're born in Africa, they live in Africa, they're Africans, all right? And in South Africa, we have a tremendous ministry going on called Cross Connect, and the leader of that is a young man in his mid-20s. He's there with a mask on the, on the right-hand side of the picture. Um, and uh, this is a little guy who uh, has um, some kind of a physical affliction. I don't know specifically what it is, but he's very vulnerable. And uh, this was the first time that our director there, Kyle, uh, had gone to visit him. And uh, 
as you can see, he was very happy that Kyle came his way. Back into, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, Zambia. Uh, you, you, see, you see something going on here. Um, the person to whom we're ministering or our volunteers are ministering is that man in the middle of the picture. He's able to sit on that chair. You can see he's very thin, but we, we've, you know, uh, he's just been uh, cared for. The, uh, one of our male volunteers, who's not in the picture, uh, I think he's taking the picture, has um, uh, helped him with uh, personal hygiene um, and has anointed some of his bed sores. Uh, in his case, he actually lives inside a, a, a warehouse type building that is also used as a church. And you see those speakers in the corner. Those speakers belong to that local church. So it's a kind of a multi-use building in his case, but you see the mattress over to his right, and that's where he sleeps. And uh, some food has been prepared for him, and you'll see, you see volunteers on either side of him. Here's some of our volunteers, and uh, they're carrying uh, a month's supply of uh, cooking oil, uh, mealy meal, or nchima, it's ground cornmeal. Uh, uh, there's a cooking oil in Chima, there is salt, there's sugar, um, and there's some bars of soap and some topical medicines. They're in those bags. And uh, each of them are going to be going to uh, different uh, homes where orphans and widows are in desperate need. Uh, and they provide them with food security. Now, there's something I should say about this food security issue. These women here, every one of them is a widow themselves. Every one of them has children. Every one of them is ministering out of their own desperation. I'm totally astonished at these people. I've never once had any volunteer ask me for anything. They're there to give. And I know, because I've been to many of their homes, they have nothing. And so I determined years ago with WOW that I would not have any of these precious volunteers going out to minister to orphans and widows who themselves had empty stomachs or who themselves were food insecure. And so the food you see them carrying, and they're about to go to various homes with, with those uh, supplies, they basically get the equivalent themselves once a month. And this literally keeps body and soul together. It's astonishing. You look at that, what appears to be a small amount, but they make a little go a long way. And this literally keeps uh, body and soul together. And I also have mandated that any of their children who are school age have their school fees paid so they can go to school. Because to me, education and Jesus, you know, are the way out of this vicious uh, cycle of poverty and, and disease. <laughs> I, I like this pic. This is one of our pastors. And, um, you know, he's, he's not posing, but just caught in the moment where he's saying, Jesus can do it. <laughs> God is good, and He is good all the time. <laughs> I, I'm always so impressed with our, our African pastors. They're so positive and so forthright in their, in their message, and wearing a very colorful mask with a very fashionable hat. <laughs> Here's uh, one of our volunteers, and she's just simply uh, thanking uh, the Lord for His, his provision. Uh, She's about to break down that uh, supply of uh, mealy meal into um, um, uh, separate bags. She's already done one uh, with another a big bag, but she's that yellow uh, bag in front of her. She's just put some mealy meal in there. You see the, the cooking oil and you see the, uh, the sugar uh, and she's uh, getting things ready to go out. Uh, getting back to South Africa, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, we have white Africans as well as black Africans. And that's a lesson for a lot of people. They were born and bred and they live in Africa. They're white, but they're Africans. These three little kids, we've blotted out their faces, are three little orphans. And uh, our director with them, uh, you know, was informed about their need. Uh, their mother was so sick she couldn't get off her bed and they had literally no food in the house. And so uh, we did our best, and now they're a part of our uh, uh, weekly, or I should say monthly uh, commitments, and that little family is now being cared for. 
Um, now we've shifted over to uh, Zambia. And here's um, three of our Zambian volunteers. And you'll notice uh, something new in the pick. This is not food. This is medication, all right? These are meds that um, through an interesting connection that I've had now for two decades, we're able to access through something called Health Partners International. Health Partners International is an international organization that accesses overruns of drugs, overruns of medical supplies. Uh, their shelf life is totally current, but these are overruns. Plus, they're also sometimes given out of the goodness of the heart of the, of the drug companies. But all that you see in that pic are some of the medications and medical supplies that we provide for our orphans and widows who are desperately ill and in need of help. For those who, whose need goes beyond these supplies, we make sure that we get them to a local clinic and we follow it up and make sure they're dealt with properly so that whether they live or whether they die, it's with dignity and it's all done in the name of Jesus. How good is that? Why dance when you have very little? When you live from day to day with food insecurity, rampant disease, sickness, and death? You dance because your heart is full of love for God and your hope is strong. WOW has come alongside as the hands and feet of the Lord, providing both home-based care and assurance of God's love. You're happy and you've got to dance. Please support WOW. Let's keep them dancing. Now, friends, as I said last program, I'm not going to do this every show, but uh, this show and last show, I, I wanted to just give you an update on the work we're doing with Working for Orphans and Widows. And I am absolutely unabashedly unashamed in saying, we need your help. Um, you can help us help these precious people in their thousands in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southern India. And we do it all through local churches, all through local church volunteers. And we got a 21 year track record. And a lot of you have known me for years. Um, we're a broker, if you will, that you can trust. And as I trust you, together we trust the Lord. Amen? By God's grace, we can make it happen. And so when you support WOW or support JCT TV, that's what's happening. We're all a part of this big picture. And the coordinates are always there on the screen from time to time during the course of the program. So you know how to access us through the internet or through phone call or through letters. Uh, choose your means, but whatever you do, do it as soon as you can. Thanks for your help. See you next time.